Hello, welcome to Adopt N Plus, and thank you for joining the channel. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here with you. Um, I'm doing this series for people who will be taking the exams soon, within a week. Um, I encourage you to listen to this series. It will be a couple of questions um, to focus you, get you perspective, and know where um, you stand, basically, and just basically to make you think about questions that may probably show up. And I'm doing them based on how the end class is graded. They have different classification, management of care, physiological adaptation, and all those things. And so they divide them into segments. So I'm taking the first one. This is just a few questions, just five questions to highlight some points that you need to know. There may be more questions that you need. You can go to a Q bank to help with that. So I hope this help you stick around and see how we answer questions um on your exams so the first question is ethics question um which is play a big role in the uh, management of care so we have a patient and then of course i like sata so everything will be on selector that apply um so i'll read the full question and we use the strategy to do that a client asks a nurse to explain the following ethical principles which of the following will require intervention by the next manager, select order apply. You know how we do select order apply. You read the last portion of the question, which of the following will require um, intervention by the next manager, that's our ask. The clients basically need explanation from the next, that's the case and the buzzword is ethical principles and the next manager. So then we take our content that we know, then we go to each other's choice. So we are going for intervention. They say something wrong, we intervene. Pay attention so that you don't select the right answer, the wrong answer. So you see I underline intervention, intervention. So you write it at your asked and the buzzwords. Intervention and ethical principles. Intervention, ethical principles. So as such, if you don't take your medication, I will lock you down. Yes, you threatening the patient. This is a threat. Threatening is a form of answer. And therefore, this is a right ethical principle. I don't need to intervene. False imprisonment. A nurse raised both sides of the rail, uh, bed rails. Yeah, if you raise both sides of the bed rails, you're preventing the patient from getting that. So you falsely uh, uh, imprison them. This is right statement and pairing. Invasion of privacy. The nurse can release your record to your employer any time of the day. No, they need your consent. You have to sign a consent. Medical record is a legal document. They need your consent before they can do that. If they don't, they have invaded your privacy. So we need intervention here. Autonomy, you make your own medical decision. Yes, your own is the right keyword. Your own medical decision is being autonomy. Veracity, I call your doctor about your pain as promised. You promise it and you did it. So you are being what? Truthful. Definition of veracity. So this doesn't need intervention. Battery, if I touch you without your consent. A touch, yes, physical contact without a consent is considered battery. So you don't need any intervention. Justice, we treat everyone equally without regard to any socioeconomic factors. The word is equal, equal is justice. So I'm picking the keyword. equal means justice. Therefore, you don't need to intervene yet. And these are the principles you need to know. Of course, there's other one, beneficence, more beneficence. You got to also know them, but this is broadly covered most of them about the ethical principles you need to know. So, and we have select all that apply. We only have one pay, a patient to intervene. As you can see, we did not compare anything. We just keep on moving forward. So the next one is delegation and assignment. So as you know, you have to know certain principles uh, with delegation. So um, an RN, LPN, and UAP caring for a client. So there's three people caring for one client who should be assigned these tasks. Remember, when they give you this, they give you an RN, LPN and UAP, you have to assign specific tasks to them. Something the UAP will do shouldn't be given to 
LPN. So you got to distribute tax based on what they can do. So my principle for this is, this is the key for you. If you forgot, um, the RN and that's the eat, okay? They evaluate, they assess and treat everything and in initial assessment. The uh, LPN, that's what we call MMR, MMR most. That's my technique. So MMR most. The M, first M is monitoring the RN finding. Okay. They, they give most medication. The other M, the R is they reinforce the teaching from the RN. M is the same thing, most medication. O is they take care of the stoma. Stoma means gastrostomy or ileostomy or colostomy. S, they can do certain special tests like a neurovascular check. They listen to the lungs. They listen to the bowel sounds. And T, they can give two feet. The UAP, the easy way for me to remember, and that's what I do, is anything that doesn't require thinking. They think, okay? They, they, they do their thing. They, they're very strong. They know their thing. Uh, but the best way to... Remember, then they do things that doesn't require too many mental work. Like you, they don't need to do assessment. They don't need to do. If you ask them to go take a patient vital, they just go. The machine is there. They hook the machine. The machine does the reading, and that's all. You ask them to go you know, check the patient urine. They go. The urine is there. They empty it and they record it. If you say go watch the patient eat, they go there and they stand there and the patient eat. Patient has a problem, they can do assessment, they call you. So that's the way I remember that. So let's answer the question. Now we know our content, we take it. So that's how you do your SATA. You already expected what you're looking for and you take it with you. So change stoma of the back, this has to be done by the LPN, she does this. Even though the nurse should do it, no, this has to be done by the LPN. Vitals of a patient after 48 hours. Usually the UAP does that. Change feeding tube is the LPN. They are in a team, so you assign appropriate tax to each one. Measuring urine output, you're just measuring it. You don't do anything, you're just measuring. You just look at the urine and measure it. That's a UAP job. Check, check blood glucose of a patient before meal. This is tricky, okay? If I have to check your glucose before meal, I'm doing assessment whether um, your sugar is low or high because people probably will give you insulin. So this has to be done by the RN. She does the assessment. Listen to long sounds after a blood roll. So I've treated you and I have to listen to your long sounds. This has to be required assessment, evaluation, RN. Virals within 15 minutes of blood transfusion. Within the, so this is the key. Before you start blood transfusion, UAP get a blood and uh, virus. As soon as you start the blood transfusion, within the first 15 minutes, the RN is responsible. After 15 minutes, she can delegate to the UAP to do that. If the patient is unstable, she continue to do that. The reason why is called the first 15 minutes is when you have anaphylactic reaction. So the first 15 minutes, this has to be done by RN. Virus after one hour after um after blood transfusion has to be, the nurse can delegate to the UAP. I did not say that patient is in shock or is having any problem. So that you can assume that the nurse cannot delegate. Neurovascular check has to be done by the LPN. And that's everything you need to know about delegation in this little slide. So take it with you and then uh, use the MMR most, use the EAT and then the rest. Whatever you want to remember with the UAP is fine. Okay, so informed consent. You have to know about this. Management of care is they always like to trick you with this informed consent. This slide is just to uh, emphasize all the things you need to know about informed consent. So you have informed consent. It's a select thought apply. We read the last portion. Which of the following need intervention? So we got to intervene by a nurse manager. That means something is wrong. Several clients need informed consent. Which of the following, the nurse manager need to intervene, okay? A 12-year-old girl requesting birth control. Well, you don't need intervention. 
There is some people we call them emancipated minor. A young a minor is anybody less than 18. So if you are a minor, you're asking for birth control, it's acceptable. If you're going for uh, in, um, psychiatric evaluation, it's, if you have drug abused and then you want rehab, it's acceptable. So all these people, if you have birth control, you're requesting birth control, yes, acceptable. If you have S S sexually transmitted disease and you want treatment, yeah, you don't need a consent from anybody. That's acceptable. We call them, um, it basically is allowed. That's a uh, exception to people who are minor that need a consent. A 16-year-old army corporal signed a consent for surgery. It's a 16-year-old. He's in a hammy. What do you think? If I'm going to die and kill people and I can get, get killed, why can't I sign consent for myself? That's the best way to remember it. If they have to go and fight for the country and then you don't want them to sign for the consent for somebody else, no. Uh, they are emancipated. I know. So this, we don't need intervention. We don't need intervention. Surgeon took a patient to surgery with severe subarachnoid hemorrhage with a GCS of four. No family available. Think about it. I have a severe brain injury. My GCS is four. I can't do anything. There's no family member available. The surgeon took me to surgery. Yeah, that's acceptable. We call it implied consent. Implied. That means if I'm able to do that, the GCS of four means the patient can't talk. I try to trick you, but I put it there. I can't talk. So if I'm able to do that, I will. I tell the surgeon, okay, you got to save my life. So if nobody is there to save my life and I can do that, the doctor can do that. So I don't need to intervene. A father refused surgery for 10-year-old with interception. Interception is a life-saving uh, problem. Surgery for interception is a life-saving problem. If you don't do anything, the kid will be ischemic, the bar will die, and the kid will die. We cannot allow father to allow his 10-year-old to die. So this, we need intervention. Usually, he will go to the hospital. Hospital will get a court order and assign somebody to take care of the kid. A schizophrenic patient with catatonic features, okay, and severe hallucination was admitted without consent. So if you have a psych patient who has this catatonic means they have a severe um negative symptoms basically they can stay at one place they can't move it's, it's telling me that this patient cannot take care of themselves so they cannot do their self-need and you go to Maslow usually I don't like talking about Maslow and uh, stuff but this is a physiological you, you need to provide your physiological need anybody with a psych issue need a physiological need about catatonic features okay um usually they cannot do anything. Um, they can take care of themselves. So if no, the a psych patient cannot take care of themselves, they are homicidal, they will kill somebody, or suicidal, they kill themselves, you got to, you can admit them without a consent. So that's um, acceptable. So the only person is number four. So like I said, these highlight everything you know about informed consent. So when you see it, this is stuff you need to be able to spill it out. Okay, guys. In the legal advanced directives, you have to know this, okay? They will put in this question form, try to trick you, okay? Select all that apply. Which statement from the client need immediate intervention? A client asks a nurse about advanced directives. When they put the word advanced directives, I want you to think carefully. It's either power of attorney, or living will. These are the two types. If they don't tell you, just consider both. Okay, so patient asks about advanced directives. So it's both, it's an advance. You do it ahead. Directives, telling somebody about something. That's the meaning of advanced directives. Okay, doing it ahead before you have a problem and then, um, and then yeah, they can take care of it. So it's both living will and then power of attorney. If they want you to talk about power of attorney, they will tell you. So if the questions are advanced directives, they're referring to both. Um, so select all that apply. We need immediate intervention. For living will, 
my children may make a left a will here or a living will. My children um, make the decision. And then for power of attorney, I will make the decision. So it's the opposite, okay? Living will, you decide. This is what I want. This is this and that and that, that I want. At this time, I don't want to be intubated, this and that. You write it and you state it. Power of attorney, you assign somebody and, st and with the hope that they will make the decision for you at your best interest. That is the difference. Your best interest is being taken care of by the person that you designed to do that. But the living will is where you, the individual, make the decision ahead and said, this and that I want is written and that's all. Okay? So this is wrong. Everything is final once I sign these papers. No, it's not final. So far as you're alive, you can change it. You can change your uh, uh, power of attaining the people you designated to do that. You can change your living will, whatever you've stated in it. No, until the final moment is acceptable to be changed. I will need two copies and place one in, in my car. Yes, you need two copies. Your car is no safe place to keep this document, very important document. So uh, I need to intervene. My PCP can witness my power of attorney or living will. No, your doctor has to be neutral. He does not have to tell you what to do. You have to make a decision. Somebody else has to witness it. So doctor, nurses, nobody, even the power of attorney that you designated will not sign that. So we need intervention. I will need additional, uh, this is additional DNA order to supplement. Yes, when you do the living will, sometimes you need a power, of, uh, do not resuscitate order because your, your power of attorney and the living will doesn't carry with you. So in case you're, you're on the street and you, 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 you code it and they see a bracelet saying DNA, yeah, they will not do anything. Power of attorney doesn't do that. So you need additional DNA order and then you can carry it with you. That one is mobile. These are mobile staff. And then that can be recorded. So this is a good question. Analyzing everything about advanced directive. So I hope you guys enjoy that. And then lastly, prioritization. So, you know, I've talked about prioritization. So I do not want to put, who do you want to see? I want to pay more attention to delegation and assignment. I know people get confused about delegation and assignment, especially in terms of room assignment. So I paid attention to room assignment. It's easy question that you shouldn't get it wrong. And they will ask you, they will trick you. They will give you pictures. So you should also look for pictures. Look for pictures and see what's up. Some, well, some of these disease process look like, like a rash, somebody with measles. How does it look? You should look for it. How does um, a chicken pox look on a picture? If they give you a picture, they can trick you with that too. They, they won't say the name, but they will give you a picture and say, somebody has this rash. What is it? What is it? it may be chicken pox, measles, you know, Kawasaki, all those things. Try that. You know, you can go to Google and get the images. So, assignment. As you've seen, I've, I usually go by principles, two principles. Do not infect the other patient. We are bodies, we are in the same room, but don't infect me, okay? I came here for a problem. I need to keep my problem with me. I don't want a second problem, <laughs> sorry, but that is the idea. Don't infect me. We can be bodies, but don't infect me. That's number one. Number two, it has to be same organism. So if we have this, we have, um, the same organism, okay, um, then we can stay together, you know, fine. But just because we are on contact precaution doesn't mean I can be together if you have a different organ. So that is the principle. We can have the same precaution, but we cannot be together because our organisms are different. A client with MRSA and a client with VRE cannot be together, even though they are contact. So this is negative. A client with slap chick rash and a client 12 week pregnant. So slap chick is power B19. This is B19. This is very infectious. 
that can cause teratogenic disease to the baby. Therefore, they can be together. A client post appendectomy and a client um, getting NG tube is fine. It's just drainage of NG tube. So um, this is okay. We can, so this is right answer. This is right answer. This is no. So a client on a adalimumab for Crohn's disease and a client with flu, they cannot be together. It's because this is a, a immunomodulator that will make the Crohn patient immunocompromised, and this is a problem. A client after gastric bypass and a client with the rectal bleeding is susceptible. Rectal bleeding patient doesn't mean they're infectious. They're just bleeding, GI bleed. And therefore, you don't need to. So this is one, two, and five. Pay attention to this assignment, room assignment, the two principles, and you can answer any room assignment question. Thank you for listening. And these are five questions to highlight some portion of uh, management of care. And then think you get enough information. Thank you for watching to the end. And um, tell friends about this video. They may benefit from them, share with them, invite them so that we can improve the channel and keep going. Thank you very much and have a blessed day.